So today we're going to talk about how to vibe code responsibly with a little help from MCPs. We're going to start with a little game of never have I ever. So the way this is going to work is you're going to put five fingers up and for whatever you have done before, uh, I think I can't see my speaker notes. Yeah, I guess I'm just going to do this without speaker notes. That's okay. <laughs> but for whatever you have done before, uh, put your finger down. Awesome. So never have I ever asked AI for answers instead of Google. I have done that, unfortunately. All right. Never have I ever merged AI-generated code that I didn't understand. I also have done that guilty. You <laughs> All right, I found my vibe coders. Let me introduce myself. My name is Rizal Scarlett. I go by Black Girl Bytes on the internet. I'm the tech lead of open source developer relations at Block. If you've never heard of that before, that's the company responsible for Cash App and Square and Tidal and Afterpay. Uh, Block also built one of the first MCP clients called Goose. It's an open source AI agent. And I'm one of the developer advocates for it. Now, I will address the elephant in the room. I know, I know, vibe coding is like so, like February, March 2025. We're literally at the end of October right now. The tech industry moves so fast. But hear me out, even though people aren't talking about it as much, I still definitely see vibe coded PR. So people are still doing it. And if you don't know what vibe coding is, it's the practice of letting your AI agent generate all the code and you just end up merging to main. You don't look at the code, or as Andreas Kaparthi would put it, you forget that the code even exists. So many developers have felt really averse to this concept, and I get it. While vibe coding is revolutionary and helps developers, or yeah, helps developers to work faster and non-engineers who could only dream of certain products, it is also incredibly and dangerously irresponsible. It basically encourages non-engineers and engineers alike to add insecure code, making uh, enterprise code bases ripe for attacks. It also discourages people from taking the time to understand the code that's generated, which then leads to scalability issues, persistent bugs, or even losing all your code. Here's an example. We have this Twitter user that's like, this is the worst day ever. They like start describing that their code got corrupted, but when I scroll through the thread, what happened is they gave Claude a prompt, and Claude just deleted all the code that they had, and they had to start all the way over. So that's why engineers are really redefining and reclaiming this phrase. Simon Willison, who I look up to, coined the phrase vibe engineering, where engineers work with LLMs while staying proudly and confidently accountable for the software that they produce. There's also another term I really like called chiseling by Patrick Erickson, who works at Continue. He says working code isn't finished code, and you need to chisel away the AI-generated excess to basically reveal the clean, logical core beneath. Whatever you want to call it, whether it's vibe engineering or chiseling, or I like to call it responsible vibe coding, the, code princ the core principles are still the same. To vibe code responsibly, you need three things. You need power, control, and context. So let's talk about that. Remember, in this situation, you're the captain now, while your AI is the co-pilot. I really think GitHub was ahead of this game when it named their tool Copilot because it set this home that you shouldn't just be a passenger hoping for the AI to take you in the right direction. You're really responsible for the entire journey. So if you're the captain and your AI is the co-pilot, you need a co-pilot that's actually competent, that can actually fly the plane and is actually smart, right? So for a lot of AI agents, the LLMs are the brains of the operation, and each of them has different capabilities. So you don't want to just pick one that everyone's hyping up online. You want to think about certain things, like does it have tool calling capabilities? For example, will this LLM be able to enable your AI agent to act on your behalf, or is it just going to turn your AI agent into a glorified chatbot? You also want to think about context window size. This is how much it can remember in a specific session. Think of it as like your AI's working memory. And then you also want to consider performance on code tasks. Some models are really better at reasoning through complex code than others. And I tend to use Claude Sonnet 4.5, Claude 4, and GPT 4.0. Um, Goose has this really cool feature where I could set one of the models to be the reasoner and then the other one to do the execution. And I can kind of do this multi-model mix. 
Now let's talk about context. Even though you might have like the most powerful LLM combination ever, you still need the right context and innovate information to get to your AI agents. So here's an illustration of why context matters. I don't know, has any of y'all's moms ever asked you to go get her purse when you were younger? I don't know if it's just me. Okay, right? And then usually for me, I run into her room and I'm like, oh my God, you have like 47 other black purses. So I don't know which one to choose, but I'm too nervous to ask her because I don't want her to say like, don't make me come in there and get it. So I'm like, all right, I'm just going to grab one. And I bring it to her. Um, but what ends up being the issue is that she didn't give me enough context or your mom didn't give you enough context. She should have said, like, go get my black coach purse on the second shelf, maybe it's on the left-hand side. That's similar to why AI tools tend to hallucinate, because we didn't give them enough context. So here's some situations or some methods that I use to give my AI agents more context. I usually use these context files. So agents typically universally respect an agents.md file. This is where you can give additional guidance. Um, Goose respects the Goose hints. Cursor respects cursor rules, copilot does copilot instructions, and so on and so forth. But in my goose hints file, I typically write, make a commit after every change. This really creates a granular version history in Git. And if the AI tool makes a change for me that I thought looked good initially, but then it turns out to be problematic later, I can easily pinpoint the time that it happened and roll back. That way, I'm not like searching through the code and being like, oh my god, did it change this line? I don't know. I'm running out of time, but I wonder if I can get extra because of the little, <laughs> OK. Um, this brings me to another concept to bring in more context to your AI agent. And that's MCP, or Model Context Protocol. This is an open standard that enables su any supporting AI agent to connect to and grab data from any tool using natural language prompts instead of a specific syntax. So for example, you can connect your AI agent to your database, and you don't got to write SQL queries. You can just say, like, select all the number of people that attended my talk, or whatever it is. Um, similarly, you can use something like the Blender MCP server and not know how to use the Blender interface, but connect it to your AI agent and just tell it, create me a 3D scene. But we're going to talk about the GitHub MCP server. This allows you to do things like rebase and fix merge conflicts. Sometimes I forget the syntax of the commands, even though I understand how it works. But it does a little bit more than just version control. It also helps you with GitHub projects. I discovered this when my team moved from Asana to GitHub projects to track our work. We're so used to the calendar view, and GitHub projects doesn't really have that. So it was an adjustment for us. And at first, I was like, oh, I'll just create a calendar view app for everyone. And then I realized that's just creating an additional tool that's still annoying. And then I realized, wait a minute, we all use Goose. We all use the GitHub MCP server. Maybe we can just manage our issues um, within Goose with the GitHub MCP server. Um, the other part of that is I was talking back and forth with it in textual prompts. And I was like, what if I enabled myself to see like an interface that would be more intuitive to us as um, humans? So I used something called MCP UI, which adds that additional layer. So I'm going to show you guys it right now. Let's see. All right, you guys can see that? Yeah. OK, cool. So first thing I'm going to do is something simple. I'm just going to say, like, create a GitHub issue. Actually, let me make sure my MCP server is enabled. Good. Create a GitHub issue that says speak at GitHub universe, um, or that's titled. And assign it to Black Girl Bytes. And I want this to happen in the square up developer programs repository. So what we should see is Goose should be able to use the GitHub MCP server, make a tool call called issue write. It'll write that, and it'll return the response to me. So I can click this URL just to make sure it actually worked, and there's my issue. But remember I talked about something called MCP UI, which adds that, like, interface layer to interacting with your agent. Your agent can now respond to you in like an interface and not just text. 
So I'm going to make sure I have the right extensions on. And I'm going to tell it, show me my team's project calendar. And what it should do is it should render a literal calendar um, that I can actually interact with. So it might take a little bit of time. The LLM's talking with Goose. They're like, what should I do here? They're making the plan and everything. So when it comes back, we have a project calendar, right? Yeah. Um, and I can interact with this. I can literally click buttons here, like analyze workload, and it'll tell me like, oh, this person has a light workload and this person has a heavy workload. So we're gonna see that before I go back to the slides. Here it is, it tells us who has a lighter or heavier workload based on the tickets it found. <laughs> I'm not trying to expose you. <laughs> All right. Uh, let me bring this back. <laughs> Ooh. Okay. Uh, we're doing it. Hold on. There we go. Sorry. Okay. Now let's talk about control, right? We talked about how your AI has power and context, but you need, still need to essentially stay in control. The whole value of software engineering isn't just writing syntax, it's solving problems thoughtfully for now, the future, and the impact on users and the systems. So I like to stay in the, co stay in the code with my AI agent so I'm like more aware and engaged of everything that's going on. This is where something called ACP or agent client protocol comes in. It allows you to bring any supporting agent to any supporting editor, and instead of context switching between your AI chat window and your code editor, you can stay engaged where the changes are happening right away. Um, and I think this is where I'm able to apply what Patrick Erickson referred to as chiseling, because I can pay attention to the code changes and manually make them on my own. I'm just gonna share this quote. Hopefully I could do it fast enough. Working code isn't finished code. The kernel of what you actually wanted is buried underneath a mountain of AI-generated sloth. Duplicated functionality, a thousand line methods, useless unit tests, you need to chisel away the excess to reveal the clean, logical core beneath. And that's what's really exciting about this philosophy of keeping developers in control. We are seeing this become an industry standard. Even in the keynote yesterday, we saw them um, announce the agent HQ, where they said, we're bringing in any agent to our platform. So whether it's open protocols like ACP or GitHub's agent HQ, we're thinking about how do we give developers direct control over their AI collaborators. Um, and this is just a screenshot of me bringing Goose into um, something called Zed, a code editor called Zed. So now when I do this, I'm more likely to critically think and say, does this actually solve a problem? Is this scalable? Are there actual security implications here? And does this fit within our existing architecture? So whether you want to call it vibe engineering or chiseling, the key is remembering you're the pilot. You're giving AI the power through its LLM capabilities and tool calling you're giving it, or it's giving you that. You're giving it context through proper information management and MCP, and you maintain control by staying engaged and reviewing changes. So AI coding is not really going away, I don't think. It's only becoming more powerful. The question isn't whether to use AI in your development workflow, it's how to do it responsibly. So if you want to learn more about Goose or GitHub MCP server or MCP UI, scan this QR code um, to keep coding responsibly with AI. And, okay, I made it in between the time. Thank you so much, y'all.